So, Jules, over to you. Okay. Right, so stick me back down here. Are you all not exhausted yet? <laughs> I don't want to tell you, it's a really nice evening outside and you're missing it. it seems a bit unfair. I won't take up a great deal of your time. Um, I'm very grateful to be asked to speak here tonight. I realise um, I was told that it was between me and Dave Hockney. <laughs> and as we're both like appalling <coughs> recluses, um, they could obviously winkle me out easier than you could winkle out <laughs> Hockney. I was like, at least I won't be smoking. You're less grumpy. I'm a less grumpy. Well, you don't know me. I've been not very well in that um, I was not born in Bradford. Um, I choose to live here. I've chosen to live here for a very long time, probably about now nearly 40 years. I was born in uh, Colchester in the barracks. My father was in the SAS. Previous to that, he'd been in the Rajput Regiment. My mother was a secretary in the Secret Service. <laughs> <laughs> My father's idea of amusement in the evenings. My father uh, was um, an interesting man in that even though he was a man of his generation, I'm 56 so you can sort of get an idea of how old he was, he, had, he did not discriminate between men and women. As far as he was concerned, all monkeys could climb. <laughs> he wasn't bothered. Uh, so I was brought up basically as a, he would have brought up his son, which meant for amusement in the evenings, uh, we did games like he would teach me 11 ways to kill a man silently. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, this isn't a I'm not joking. And if I got it right, which I frequently did, uh, I got rewarded with Cadbury's Miss Shapes. I don't know if you remember them. Don't, don't worry, sweets. Um, so uh, my mother was an extremely glamorous woman. Uh, she had modelled for Vogue, in, uh, but in those days, of course, when you got married, you had to cease doing such frivolous things. Um, and so she became a secretary in the private sector and worked for the, um, in the end, she worked for the architectural department in Harrogate, which is where we moved up to, and where I got my schooling at Belmont Berkman's Independent High School for Young Ladies, <laughs> um, which was a private finishing school, which, as you can see, did not work, <laughs> which is why I can't do maths. And the reason why I can't do maths is because the first day I got there, or the first week I was there, whatever, um, I, I was wandering around in an arty haze in the normal, my normal manner and the teacher said to me, you're not enjoying maths, darling, are you? <laughs> and I said, no, no, miss, I, I don't like it at all. I, I don't really understand it. And they said, well, darling, don't do it. You do double art instead. It'll be fine. <laughs> I was like 11. I said that to an 11-year-old. They're going to go, thank you. And I have now no idea how to do long division. <laughs> However, <laughs> I'd like to say that served me well, but it didn't, because being enumerate is not a good thing. But nonetheless, so I went on from there, I left school eventually. I, I transferred, actually, because I was, I was discovered as a, <laughs> this is really mortifying, I was discovered as a poet, child poetry prodigy. <laughs> now, doesn't this sound grand? You know, and your man will be really thrilled. And my man was indeed really thrilled. My work at the age of uh, about 12 was critiqued by Ted Hughes, um, who wrote me a letter about how I should proceed and suggested that perhaps I should stop writing about space travel. <laughs> I didn't really know anything about it, um, which kind of stood me in good stead. And then, and then that meant that I was shoved up onto various platforms in scratchy frocks with my hair in ringlets <laughs> to recite. It was grim. And um, so I was then moved to Harrogate Grammar, where it all started to go wrong. Within a month of being at Harrogate Grammar School, um, I was expelled for nearly running the headmistress over whilst on the back of Dusty Miller's Bonneville, wearing a mini, not him, me, wearing a miniskirt, <laughs> and uh, obviously with the helmets in those days, and a full school uniform, so she couldn't miss who I was. We came out of the school uh, uh, sort of parking area where he put his bike and, and she stepped out in front of us and said, HALT! <laughs> and, and we couldn't because there weren't any brakes, but she didn't know that. <laughs> so I got expelled. Um, that was all right. I went and did a bit of uh, training at uh, the local art school, as, uh, which was quite a well-known art school, Harrogate Art School at one point. It was quite respectable. Small, but respectable. And uh, I did illustration. This stood me in good stead later. However, around that time I also got involved with motorcycle gangs 
And when I was 19, I married a Satan slave. <laughs> As you do. Uh, a Satan slave, for those of you not au fait with uh, youth subcultures, um, is an English variant of the Hells Angels. Uh, rather disrespectfully, myself and my female friends within the gang, of course, we can't be in the gang because the crops would fail. Fenrir <laughs> Winter would be upon us and Fenris the Wolf would be howling at the door now. It was completely forbidden. But, of course, we were, as often is the case, the power behind the throne. And we used to refer to the lads as Satan's mates, but not within hearing. <laughs> so, um, this is when I actually first came to Bradford. My husband, who's a very nice young man, uh, apart from being an angel, uh, he bred rabbits. But, um, <laughs> Life is always complicated, people. It's never as you think it's going to be. Uh, we moved to Bailden, which many of you will know as the delightful, picturesque village just outside of Bradford. And I know as that place where all the Moravians lived. The Moravians, having settled Bailden very early on, they were uh, uh, quite an extreme Protestant religious Christian cult who'd been expelled from Germany. Uh, or left Germany, perhaps, in the Moravian area, uh, because of their, their strong beliefs. Or because they were completely annoying. I've never found out which one. But anyway, they lived in Belden, and so did I. And so did my husband and his motorcycles. And we built uh, the big rigs, which you may have seen in films, you know, with the long extended forks and the, the high bars and the chop seats and all that. Straight people call them choppers. We don't call them choppers because we think that's rude. <laughs> we call them rigs. So he used to build them. He used to build them in the attic. <laughs> Not best practice, that really. <laughs> <laughs> we have to actually break down the front of the flat and get a block and tackle to get the damn thing out. <laughs> uh, that was interesting. The whole village, including all the Moravians, turned up. So, I was a gang member. I was a genuine gang member of the sort that you now see on television with some bald guy who used to be in a soap opera goes and interviews them? I don't know. I know they're winding him up though. <laughs> As you can tell if you know about that sort of thing. So that's, that was what I was doing. I was being in a gang. I'd, I, I had stopped being a poetry prodigy because I just didn't think there was anything in it for me. I didn't stop writing, of course, and I, neither did I stop drawing. Uh, shortly after this, I met uh, the lead singer of the band New Model Army. Um, they had not yet started. We started that band together. Um, and I started it with my father's advice, which was to sit down and write out a business plan. <laughs> so um, in the Arndale Centre, uh, there was a terrible calf. And I sat in the terrible calf where we all used to sit and make, you know, one cup of coffee last four and a half hours. Um, and wrote down the business plan, the model, uh, which I was going to uh, work New Model Army on, uh, on the back of an envelope. And it was, roughly speaking, Ben and Jerry's. It was the family model of business. In that what you do is you want to ensure longevity for your product or for your company. You create a sense of response between the company, or in this case the band, and the client, or in this case the fans. You make them feel included. You make them feel like family. This worked to such a degree that the fans of New Model Army, which have now the band's been going for th over 30 years, they have an enormous worldwide following and they refer to themselves as the family. Nobody seems to have heard of Charlie Manson apart from me, <laughs> but they, they do. And they're, they're, they're faithful to the point of obsession. Um, the band, the model, worked. As this was going on, I decided also that I would uh, continue with the poetry, so I did that. I had a number of six books out very successfully in my first book of poetry sold over, I don't know, can't do the maths, it was about 2,000 copies, which is good for a poetry book. Um, and I had it, the first one out on Virgin Books because none of the, the, the big houses would touch work by somebody like myself, i.e. in that time a big goth. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, so I thought, well, what do I know? I know rock and roll. I know gangs, and I know rock and roll. I'll try rock and roll. So we went to Virgin, who were at that point doing publishing, and I said to them, I want to do a book of poetry, and they said, oh, it's you, and I went, yes. And they went, all right, then. I went, what, a big size? Yeah, no problem. 
Oh, lots of illustrations. Yeah, sure. Big, big colour photographs. Yeah, yeah. Fancy fonts. Loving it. Can I have three dozen red roses delivered to the photo shoot? Sure. Do you want the limo? Yeah, all right. They literally, I used to go in there and invent things to ask them for. Because <laughs> I couldn't think of it. Anyway, it came out and it sold like gazillions, and I did like 64 interviews in two and a half days to promote it, because that's what they did. They also went bust. It's hardly surprising. But um, <laughs> it was very successful. Um, this went on for many years. I designed all new model armies, album covers, t shirts, DVD covers. CD covers when it came, um, everything. And for this I got a, a gold record from EMI, which made me laugh a great deal, because when I presented them with the, with the classic New Model Army cover, which is basically a white LP cover, and in the middle, about yo big, is a piece of Celtic interlock, a hand drawn. And they said, what the is that? <laughs> and I said, it's the album cover. And they said, no, it isn't. We want a photo of the band looking moody. <laughs> I said, I've got a million of those because they never look anything else, but we're not having that. <laughs> and we had a huge fight and they eventually gave in. And then two years later, I sold a million copies. They said, we'd love to present you with this gold record. <laughs> Your services to the music industry. And I was gracious. <laughs> But you know, like it is in Bradford, you're doing it behind your back, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, then I decided that I was getting slightly bored. Um, I was also on the road at this point selling t-shirts to New Model Army, which I did for like, as part of this, this whole thing about engaging the, the fans. They always knew that somebody from the organisation was there in the hall, that they could talk to about anything they needed to at any time. And I did that for about 20 years. And um, at that time also I thought it would be about time I wrote a novel because my poems are not poems about my divorce in Tuscany and how, you know, I've got it like, you know, just come out of university and the bunnies or anything like that. They're really like small snapshots about people's lives. And um, so I decided to sort of carry on a snapshot, wrote um, a novel, didn't, I was writing it whilst on the road and entered it for this uh, thing. It won... Um, New Crime Writer of the Year, the first New Crime Writer of the Year award. Um, and, and there was a bidding war for the publishers. And it got up to £50,000. And I said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right then. <laughs> <laughs> Forced me. And they, uh, they said, when can we um, you know, expect the rest of the novel? Because I only had the first three chapters. And I said, oh, soon. <laughs> I hadn't written it, of course. I'd never written the rest of the book. They didn't know that. So I said, yeah, I'll soon, soon, soon. Just a few tweaks, you know. <laughs> and I had to go out on the t tour. So the boys uh, uh, got the tour bus. You've seen the big tour buses, haven't you? They've got the two levels. And the top level, there's like bunks and there's a lounge and all this kind of thing. So at the front of the bus, they fixed up a writing table because there was a plug. I bought a cheap laptop. And as we thundered through the night in Poland in a snowstorm, I finished it off. Occasionally, a paralytic musician would stagger up the bus like that as it's you know, she'd go and go, has it, has it killed anyone yet? <laughs> uh, no, not yet. Will you go away? I'll tell the lads. And it was like a serial story. It went through. And, and I finished it whilst on the road. And it sold, you know, gazillion. And then I presented them with the second one, which is what they had the contract was for two books, which was a book set in Spain about syphilis and not what they had in mind at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's all went a bit wrong after that. Um, so I went off and I did, I did all these literary things, which were hideous. And... Um, I decided that um, in the end I really couldn't face doing that anymore so I set up a small publishing house called Ignite Books and we just got our first book out and we've had that book out now for about three months and we're already showing profit so we're very happy about that. Um, in the meantime, when I was about 49, I thought it was time I did something different so I got an apprenticeship as a tattooist. Um, and I thought that would be an amusing and interesting thing. Um, I also thought, rather like the previous speaker said, the best thing to do is actually not do what you're expected to do. So I have never done anything like you see on Miami Inc. I have never done stuff off the wall. I have never done a walk-in off the street. All I have done is my art on people's skins. 
this has resulted in the fact that I'm now booked up till October and I have an international clientele and I have to actually find places for them to fly into. I'm currently working still at a place in Derby where I got my apprenticeship, which is an excellent studio, but I'm now opening in Bradford. Partly because Bradford is ideally situated with this kind of thing because of Leeds Bradford Airport. Um, I think one of the things that you have to remember in any kind of business or any kind of company, I'm not, you know, as such a traditional business person, but I have successfully supported myself without government money as an artist for 30 years. Oh no, we had that exhibition, that was government money, wasn't it? That was his fault though. Um, and the thing is, it's not to do what everybody else is doing. It's really that simple. If I had decided to be a tattooer, and I'd gone on and gone, right, I'm going to do all this old school stuff, exactly the stuff you see on Miami Inc., people's aunties, memorials, dogs, cherubs, you know, the lot. Who would I have been? Just another tattooer. As it is, I'm one of the most famous tattooists in England. In that space of time. Because you've got to have neck. What they used to say in Bradford, brass neck. You've got to stick your neck out. You've got to be prepared to take a risk. If you can't do that, then don't bother. It's really not worth it. I live in Bradford by choice for two reasons. One is it's cheap. <laughs> well, three reasons, actually. It's cheap, it's central, and it's beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. And those of us who lived here for a long, long time sometimes forget that. And those of us who have come here as a visitor and come with the all freighted with the, with, the, with the nonsense that the media, the national media say about Bradford, come with their eyes shut. But to say this to you now, as I walked up here to come here, it's a lovely, it is a lovely evening outside. And the sun is slanting in such a way, as it does sometimes, that the tiny little crystals that make up the sandstone in the great buildings of Bradford, for a few seconds will ignite, turning the whole city into one huge crystal. This is something that only people who've lived here for a very long time, and all the gentlemen who come up into you in the street tell you, will tell you that this is true. We have some of the most beautiful buildings in Europe. And I know this because I've been all over Europe. And it's great, but it's not Bradford. We have people from everywhere. And on the whole, we all get on. Now, I'm not saying everyone's saints. I'd never say that. I'm not saying they're saints. I'm not saying they're all perfect. I'm not saying anything like that. But we all, the people that come here and stay here, have one thing in common. And that is we have that horrible flat sense of humour that says, yes, it's crap, but it's ours. <laughs> and we love it in our own way. I have issues with Bradford Council all the time. I fight Bradford Council tooth and nail. And one of the things that annoys me the most is that most of them are not from Bradford. Most of them will not live in Bradford. And here's the rub. Either you live here and you love it, and you love it like I love it, and you tell everybody they don't know what they're talking about when they say it's rubbish or horrible or grim, or just leave. <laughs>